السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us beneficial knowledge May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this knowledge make the life of the believers easy and make our life easy in this dunya and the hereafter Through it may we enter Jannah um, Alhamdulillah before we get started Today is day 100 of what is happening to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease their affairs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them victory. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease their affairs, grant them victory in this dunya and the hereafter. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us happy by seeing their victory. Ameen ya Rabbul Alameen. Um, you know, we have to continue making dua for them. Um, this is from the least of things that you and I can do. And at the same time also realize that you know, through calamities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates a people. Through calamities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his favor upon a people. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ وَقَوْمًا إِبْتَلَاهُمْ That whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a people, he tests them. And we hope that this calamity that they're going through, it is a sign of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. And that through it, they're elevated in the sights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant them victory. Tayyib. Um, we are on hadith number 22. So, Bismillah. عن أبي عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري رضي الله عنهما أن رجلا سأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرأيت إذا صليت المكتوبات وصمت رمضانا وأحللت الحلالة وحرمت الحرام ولم أجد على ذلك شيئا قال نعم رواه مسلم. On the authority of Abu Abdullah Jabir bin Abdullah that a man questioned the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Do you think that I perform that if I perform the obligatory prayers, fast in Ramadan, feed as lawful that which is halal, and feed as forbidden that which is haram, and do not increase upon that in one of three good deeds, then I shall enter paradise? He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, Yes. Wow. Oh, awesome. um, this hadith comes to us from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu anhuma Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Amr uh, al-Ansari radiyallahu anhu um, This is a hadith and there are many like this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where a man comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says can you tell me about actions that will enter me into Jannah and generally these are the things that are mentioned and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would ask, he would be asked a lot by Bedouins this type of question. Can you just tell me what I need to do to enter Jannah? Because their worry was, what can I do now that I, I, I don't need extra that will make me from amongst the people of Jannah? Uh, this hadith here, Rawahul Imam Muslim, Imam Muslim has this in the Sahih. He has <coughs> one hadith after this, where it actually mentions from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, the name of the person that's asking this hadith. Right, um, and uh, the name is Al Nu'man ibn Qaqil. Um, he was a better one, and he was someone that was involved, very involved in jihad. Um, and this will make us understand why he says, I'm not going to increase on these things. Um, this is a hadith itself, comes in the uh, Sunan of Ibn Majah and Sunan Nasa'i from different companions with the same answers, except a uh, little bit differences on where he says, uh, where he says, Na'am, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Na'am. In what comes to us in Nasa'i, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Man sarra an yanzura ila rajulin min ahli jannah, that whoever wants like, to feel happy by looking or wants to see a man that is from amongst the people of jannah, let him look at this person, right? Because uh, he goes and he fulfills this. Uh, now this hadith, it comes to us from Abu Abdullah, Jabir ibn Abdullah, radiyallahu anhuma. Um, us being given the kunya of, of Jabir means this is the first time that we are hearing a hadith from him in Arba'in al nawi Jabir ibn Abdullah, he is from the Ansar. Um, he met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was very young. He was at the Bay'atul Aqaba in the 11th year after the descent of, uh, after prophethood. So he was with those that came from, um, that came from uh, Medina to go meet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and gave him bay'ah. Um, he was maybe 13, 14, 15 around that time. Um, when he met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the second youngest person to take place in the bay'ah. Um, and he was someone that was very connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On top of that, from amongst the people that left a lot of ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
um, over 1500 ahadith come to us from Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu. Um, he has a lot of stories with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So many, so many different stories that we could get into. Um, one that really shows, uh, you know, his dedication, especially to the gathering of the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day he's in Medina and he hears, he hears that Abdullah ibn Unais radiallahu anhu, he is, in, he is in Misr. And that he has a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Jabir does not know. And he said, I am going to go to Abdullah ibn Unais. It took him an entire month for him to get there. He says, I heard you have a hadith that I have not heard from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me what it is. Abdullah ibn Unais tells him, like Alhamdulillah, get, goes back to Medina. Um, uh, being from Medina, he spends a lot of time there. Later on in his life, he does go on and live in Asham for a little bit of time. Then he goes back to Medina. When he goes back to Medina, they say that he was the last person from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu to pass away in Medina. He passes away in the year 94, the year 94 after the Hijrah. And this is one of the reasons why he has so many ahadith. He got to live a really long time after the Prophet Sallallahu and he would have students that would come to him and they would take ahadith from him. He is from those companions whose fathers were companion, whose mother was a companion, whose sisters were a companion. He was the only son of Abdullah ibn Amr. He was the only son. And uh, he had a lot of sisters. In the battle of Badr, he was present. But he did not fight in the battle of Badr. In the battle of Uhud, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam made it a condition that if one person comes from the family, you cannot bring another person. His father, who is older than him, was the one that was chosen to go from the family. Jabir ibn Abdullah even goes to him and he says, I want you to just let me go this one and every other battle I will let you go. His father tells him, you are my son and I love you. And if you were to ask me for me to give you my soul, I would give it to you. But when it comes to this, I will never give this to you. That this is more for like this is more than my nafs. This is what I want to do. And Jabir was sad. Right. So his father goes and he becomes a shaheed. He becomes a shaheed and he had a lot of sisters. And Jabir was the one that would be responsible for taking care of them. And his father also had a lot of debts. His father had a lot of debts. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like he even realizes that after the battle of Uhud, Jabir becomes very sad. He doesn't know how he's going to pay the debts and he doesn't know what he's going to do with his sisters. So that he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to him and he asks him, what makes you so sad? And he says, my father died in Uhud. And he left behind that. And he left behind, you know, daughters that I have to take care of. And I don't know how to do it. At this time, Jabir is 20 years old. The time of the battle of Uhud after is 20 years old. So he's very young, right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he makes dua for him. He tells him, uh, you know, go and try to pay the debts as much as you can. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, you know, help you. And from today on, do not say that your father has died. Do not use the word that your father has died, but your father has become, has become a shaheed. And then he recited to him the verse in Surah Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? لا تحسب أن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء عند ربهم رزقون. Do not say about those that died in the path of Allah that they're dead. They are alive with Allah subhanahu wa taala and they're being provided for. Um, the people that uh, Abdullah ibn Amr owed, uh, you know, some debts to, they came very fast. You know, like you have to pay, you have to give it, you have to give it, and they made it difficult for him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even offered them. He says, "What if we give you some of it now, and then you'll get some later?" said, no, we want all of our money now. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to gather some stuff and, and, and pay off the debts. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he received some, uh, you know, some ease for a little bit of time. And he participates in every single other battle with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His, uh, the miracle of Jabir ibn Abdullah happens in the battle of Khandaq, in the battle of Ahzab. And, uh, you know, the companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, in that battle, they suffered. This was a siege and it wasn't a battle where they were fighting one another. What ends up happening to Jabir is he sees the difficulty that the Prophet Sallallahu finds himself in, in terms of not being able to eat food. And the companions, there's nothing that is coming in and out for an entire month. So whatever food they had, it is running out. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he goes home and he sees you guys know the, uh, when they tell us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and Umar, you know, 
that they used to tie rocks to their stomach. In the Battle of Ahzab, you could say almost every single companion, this is what they had to do for them to hold back that hunger. So he sees the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says, my nafs could not, it could not bear the fact that this is what's happening. So he decides, he goes home and he asks his wife, he says, what do you have? What do you have that we can give to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? She says, I have you know, a small flour that I can turn into bread. And we have this tiny sheep that we could slaughter and use, you know, try to use some, something to give to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, go ahead and do it. So he, uh, she begins cooking. When she's done, uh, you know, the oven is still on, like the, you know, the, uh, the one that she's making bread from. And she's like, go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And do not embarrass me. Go to him and tell him secretly that I have enough food for you and maybe one other person. And let them come. Do not embarrass me by telling people there's food at the house of Jabir. So it's like very little food. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gets close to him and he tells him, I want you to, I want you to come. But I only have food for you and maybe one other person. So pick somebody and come. Jabir, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks him, what do you have at home? He says, I have some bread. And I have a little bit of sauce. That's all I have. He says, okay. He says, go and tell your wife, do not stop cooking. Just keep cooking. Like, keep the oven on, let it continue to go. So Jabir is like, okay, alhamdulillah, by the time I get home, he's going to come. As he walks away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says, Ya ahla khandaq. He says, all people of khandaq, the people that are there, they're in the trench. He says, that Jabir isna'u lakum ta'aman, he has made food for you, let's go. <laughs> Jabir, is, like he hears this as he's walking away. And this is, he doesn't know what's happening. How much, I did not make food for all of these people. So he goes and his wife right away sees that he's very sad. And then he's like, everybody from Khandaq is coming. She's like, did I not tell you not to embarrass me in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If he comes here and he sees this, how, it can't feed him. We said, maybe him and another companion. How is the people of Khandaq going to eat? And he said, I don't know. That's what the Prophet said. And then she said, if the Prophet said it, we're fine. That's what the Prophet said, khalas, we're fine. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the first one to get there. Right, he's the first one to get there. And then uh, he takes his spit and he puts it into the oven and into the sauce. And he says, continue to just keep cooking and I will feed the people. So the Jabir, he says, I'm watching, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is taking bread, and he's taking the sauce, he's giving it to them. And there was a thousand people that are coming. He said that by the time the last one received his food, those that got it in the beginning kept coming back. He said it did so, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued to feed them until there was no more food, or until all of them were satisfied, and they didn't have a need for food. Right? And this is from, you know, the barakah uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what happened to Jabir, and this became like one of the honors of Jabir radiallahu anhu after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even after this, whenever the companions would talk about one another, and they would refer to each other as, you know, like they, they would give each other nicknames, and they would call one another with honorable names, they would tell Jabir, the one that fed us at Khandaq. Jabir's house, the one that fed us at Khandaq. Right, so this became like their, his honor for him. And it was because of, uh, you know, the dedication that he saw, uh, or the like what he wanted to do for the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam and many other things that we could mention about Jabir ibn Abdullah who said he dies in the year 94 there are some of the scholars that say he died in the year 74 uh, but what appears to be most authentic is that he died in the year 94 the the last companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pass away in Medina also uh, uh, when it comes to Hajj the one that gives you the complete breakdown of the Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from beginning to end, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma. So he says that anna rajulan sa'ala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ara'ayta idha sallayta al-maktubati that if you, do you see that if I prayed the Salah, if I prayed what was upon me? And this is meaning only the five daily prayers because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what he would tell, for example, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, when he went, sent him to Yemen, was go and tell them that Allah qad kataba alaykum salawatul khams, that Allah has written upon you the five prayers, or, or, qad farad Allahu lakum, or Allah has made it fard upon you these five daily prayers. So to us, there is no other prayer outside of the five 
That is, it is an obligation upon anybody. The obligation is five. As the, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadith number, number three, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, what does he say? In that hadith, hadith number three, Abdullah ibn Umar, buni al-Islam ala khams, that Islam is built upon five. What is the first one? Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah, and then salah afterwards, right? Salah afterwards. He says, if you see, if, do you see that if I were to pray this salah, wasum to Ramadan, and that I pray, I fast the month of Ramadan. And Ramadan, we know that it is a wajib upon this ummah, an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum min alaykum tattaqoon. Allah has made it an obligation upon you, just like the nations before you, for you to attain taqwa. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ وَشَهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ That whoever, you know, comes on the month, let him fast. Right? This is when Ramadan becomes an obligation. He says, do you see when I am fasting? Uh, the month of Ramadan, I fasted. Then I say, وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ That I, <laughs> the translation says, treat halal as halal. But what it means is, I make halal what is halal. Whatever Allah and the Messenger have said halal, I say that it is halal. And he says, وَحَرَّمْتُ الْحَرَامَ And I also do the same to haram. I say that it is, whatever Allah and the Messenger have said is haram, I say it. وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا I don't do anything but this. I don't add anything to it. To the salah, I don't pray extra. To the fasting, I don't do more. I say what, what is halal, Allah has made it halal, but Allah has made haram, I say it or I treat it as such. أُدْخِلُ الْجَنَّةِ Am I going to enter Jannah? The Prophet said, Naam, yes, you are going to enter Jannah. You do these things, you are going to enter Jannah. First thing that comes to our minds is from the Arkan, he only mentioned two things. Right? From the Arkan, there are five, he mentioned two things. We'll say a person that comes with this type of question, La ilaha illallah, is already there. Right, we can assume that he's already a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's asking about Jannah. So then we'll say out of the four that are left, he only mentioned two. He only mentioned two of them. He did not mention Hajj and he did not mention Zakat. The scholars, whenever, and a lot of ahadith come in this way to us where certain parts of the pillars are excluded. Right, so does this mean if someone does not pay Zakat, or if someone does not, like he chooses not to pay zakah and not, they're not requirements for a person to enter Jannah, right? This question would come up. And the answer that the scholars come up with when they look at this hadith and others, others like it, one of the opinions that they offer is they say that the, this was before the um, other, uh, other acts became an obligation. Because if you look at the history of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made things fard upon the ummah, how he made it fard upon them, it did not happen one time. The earliest thing that was made fard upon the people is what? Out of the five, out of the four. Salah. Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, qumil layla illa qalila. Salah, as Abdullah ibn Umar says, that when Allah told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to stand a little bit during the night, it became wajib upon the people. And they used to pray, qiyamul layl. Until when they made hijrah, it became, uh, not until hijrah, the tenth year, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made salah, the five daily prayers wajib. And we know the famous hadith of Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj. One of the reasons why it was, uh, why that journey was taken was for the, uh, the salah, the five to come down, right? Then after that, out of the five, what is the next one? Saum. Saum was the next one. Saum becomes legislated in what year? In the second year, right? It becomes legislated in the, uh, the 17th of Sha'ban. In the second year after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 17 or 27, 17 or 27, it becomes an obligation. And the first type of obligation, is it one of that you have to fast or not? Did they have to fast right away? No, they could also feed. They could also feed. So in the, the first year of Ramadan, it was not a Ramadan of everybody fasting. There was, they had the option of paying. Right? Um, or they had the option of fasting. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to them, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ That whoever witnesses, خلاص, no more option of paying. No more option of paying, you have to now fast. And if you look inside of the Qur'an, these ayats are all on the same page. Right? يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ Second ayah on the page. One, two, and then شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ where the, the verse of uh, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ comes. 
Even though there's only two, uh, you know, an ayah between them, there's an entire year between their revelation. All right? Then after that, you would say, okay, we go look at zakat. When did it become an obligation? What year? Make it very easy for you. What, how many types of zakat do we have? Zakat, how many types? Zakat al-mal and zakat al-fitr. So we have zakat al-fitr and zakat al-mal. When do we pay zakat al-fitr? We pay Ramadan. So when do we think zakat al-fitr became an obligation? Second year. The 27th night of Ramadan, zakat, becomes an, zakat al-fitr becomes an obligation. And if zakat al-fitr becomes an obligation, one second. One second. I don't know what to go with it. Hello, bro. And your recording is open. And you, it's open. It doesn't open. It doesn't open. Hamza. Is, is, is there? Hold on, Baba. Is there a password for this? Yes, sir. On Zoom? Baba, I sent it on WhatsApp. I sent it on WhatsApp. Ah, yeah. Baba. Ah, okay. Uh, Alfon, that was my father, and I love you guys, but I think uh, I, I, I can't ignore his phone call for you guys, inshallah. So, um, uh, what happened is zakat al-fitr becomes an obligation the second year, okay? Zakat al-mal also becomes an obligation then. So there's not really a lot of time between the obligation of Ramadan and the obligation of zakat al-fitr for that opinion to stand. If zakat was mentioned and hajj was kept away, then we would say, that this is from, you know, what was uh, left behind, right? Like this explanation would make sense. Because Hajj does not become an obligation until when? Huh? The ninth year. The seventh or ninth. Okay. Actually, some, somebody guess. Somebody, f why do you say nine? I said nine, which is the best thing. So... The Prophet did Hajj the ninth year? I wish he did the tenth year. Who goes to Hajj the ninth year? Abu Bakr al Siddiq. Abu Bakr al Siddiq. Okay? Who goes to Hajj the eighth year? Atab. Wa Hajj Atabun bi Ahli Mawqifi. From Sira Klasa. From the Manduma. In the eighth year is when it becomes an obligation. The eighth year. The eighth year, Fathu Makkah, time for you to go to Hajj. Right, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because what month does Fath Mecca take place in? Yeah, Allah. Those of you that came to the Sira class, we are Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And this is why you have to memorize the poem. When you memorize it, you know right away. Oh, month of Ramadan. Right, month of Ramadan it happens, and then they go to Al Taif. La, Fath Mecca did not happen month of Ramadan. Yeah, Allah. Salamat. It happened in the eighth year. Allah knows best what month it happened. Now you guys got me confused. But anyways, Ibn Rajab, when he looks at this opinion, he said that this is, this is not why they exclude some of these things. It's not why they exclude it. He says for some of the Bedouins that, that asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they only mention these two things, for them, Hajj and Zakat is never going to become an obligation. So they don't concern themselves with which does not concern them. Why would I ask about Zakat? If in my future I see I will never have to pay zakat. Why well, ask about hajj if in my future I never have to go to hajj? Right? Meaning I will never have the actual capabilities of doing it. Right? Zakat is not an obligation on every single person that is sitting here. But it becomes an obligation when certain requirements are met. And if you know your condition, like in those times, I don't see myself as a person that is you know, busy with um, you know, being a businessman. So I don't have to worry about it. And Nu'man, the one, that is the, the, the one that's asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this, what we know from his history is the entire time he's in jihad. Entire jihad. 
he's not going to have the ability to gather wealth. So to him, zakat is, when, when am I going to have money to pay zakat on? Right? And then when am I going to go to hajj? I don't have the funds for it. Khalas, I'm going to be busy with this. And this is why even the Prophet sallallahu says, look at this man. If you want to see a man from the people of Jannah. Because of, these are the things that he did. He knew from the fara'id, he had to do these things. So he never m- missed their, the salah that he had. The fasting, obligation on everybody. Salah, obligation on everybody. No one is, is, is favored or no one does the obligation touch and it doesn't touch in terms of the people. While the other two, that's how, th- how it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Then, um, generally, salah and fasting would always be mentioned together when they're asking this question to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the reason for it is, there is no way that a person will ever enter Jannah if they don't pray Salah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in a hadith that comes in a tirmidhi for us, he says, Miftahul Jannati, that the key to Jannah is what? Salah. The key to Jannah is Salah. Khalas, the door is not going to be open for you if you don't have the key. And then when we come to fasting, when we come to Ramadan, this is from the obligation on every single person. You have to fast, except if you are very, like there's certain people that are excluded. But as a general rule, no one as a human being is excused from fasting. No one is from it. So these two things are very important for the, a person you know, entering Jannah. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created different doors for Jannah. One of those doors, for specifically for the people that fast. So, and the door is called what? Now we come to the next point. He says uh, that if you see me, that if I make the things Allah has made halal, I see them as being halal. And this is, you know, uh, from the things which appear easy to us. That all I have to do is say what Allah has said is halal is halal. And what Allah has said is haram is haram. I'm going to be from the people of Jannah. This is from the most difficult of things for the people to do. If you look at the people, it's either... Their desires are going to make it difficult for them to say what Allah has made haram is haram. Or the way that they look at the world will make it impossible for them to say what Allah has said halal for it to be halal. And we see this as people that are living here where you see things that we could look at and we know that it is haram. But do we actually have the ability to be able to say these things are haram? Or it just becomes like a source of confusion for the people. That people see things that Allah has made haram clearly inside of the book and in the sunnah. And people, uh, maybe that's not what it was meant. Uh, maybe, no. From the most difficult of things to do. So the way that a person applies this part of the hadith, it is that when it comes to what Allah has made halal, when it comes to it, from those that we are required to do, we do them. Because when we look at what Allah has made halal, and when you look at these two categories here, halal and haram, it is not in the sense of like a thing is halal to do and a thing is haram to do only. What it actually means is there are things that Allah has legislated. From those that Allah has legislated, there are different levels. Everything that is halal, you're not required to do them, right? Only certain things. Outside of the obligation, there are th- still things that are halal. Using this hadith itself, sunnah, sunnah, salah. Sunnah fasting, are they halal? They're, not, they're, they're halal without a doubt. But they're not like, those sunnah things are not a requirement for you to actually do them. So here it's from, this, from, you know, from the source of, as a believer what Allah has made halal is halal for me. As a believer what Allah has made haram is haram for me. That is it. That how, that's how we look at halal and haram. And then also comes to the, um, when it comes to the haram, staying away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. And generally, whenever we look at a haram, all of them need to be avoided. There is not a single haram that you and I can go into, right? Now you come to, there are things that we know without a doubt are haram, but in some cases, because of necessity, we go to them. But as a general rule, haram is haram from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Day of Judgment. The ruling of a haram thing will never change. Okay. Any questions on this hadith? Huh? Fatih Makkah in Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Taib. Let's go to hadith number twenty-three. Bismillah. 
اه كوشن عفوا اه So uh, Anas ibn Malik, where does he pass away? Uh, Anas ibn Malik passes, he lives longer than Jabir. He lives longer than Jabir. But the one that passes away the latest in Medina is Jabir. So what does, where does Anas pass away? Kufa? Who, can, who was there Thursday night? And we talked about... That's why I pointed to you. Basra, Basra. Salamat. What year? We talked about him in the hadith. Huh? 103. 103-104. What hadith did he bring to us here? Not looking. Habibi. Yeah, yeah. So you guys have to I'm tell, memorize these hadith of the Prophet. Huh? It is time for a quiz. What's the hadith of Anas? <laughs> خلاص 23 بسم الله 93 or 10 he, he, he passes at the age of not, he's 103 when he passes away if he's 103 at the at, at 93 after hijrah i think that's what it is no there's another companion that passes away after that even after jabir even after no, 94 after the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. Not 94. No, Jabir. We're talking about Jabir. Jabir. There's the, the, the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that lives the longest makes it into the year 100s or 97 or into the 100s. Inshallah, you guys look it up and bring it to us next Saturday. Or somebody share it in the group once you find out. Okay, Bismillah. 23. أبي مالك بن الحارث بن عاصم الأشعري رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الطهور شطر الإيمان والحمد لله تملأ الميزان وسبحان الله والحمد لله تملأ آني أو تملأ ما بين السماء والأرض والصلاة نور والصلاة برهان والصبر ضياء والقرآن حجة لك أو عليك كل الناس يغدو فبائع نفسه ومعتقها أو مبيقها رواه مسلم the authority of Abu Malik al Malik bin Asim al Ashari, anhu, who said, The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Purity is half of Iman. Alhamdulillah fills the scales, and Subhanallah, how far is Allah from every imperfection? And Alhamdulillah fills that which is between heaven and earth. Uh, and the Salah is a light, and charity is a proof. And patience is illumination, and Quran is a proof either for you or against you. Every person starts his day as a vendor of his soul, either freeing it or causing it to move. This hadith comes to us from Abu Malik Al Harith ibn Asim al Ash'ari, radiallahu anhu. Simply from the last the uh, place he's from, where is he from? He's from Yemen. He's from Yemen. That means he came and met the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What year? What year? Seventh year, seventh after the Hijrah. This is when the Ashairah came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, they ca- no, no, not seventh, not seventh. That's a dose. They come a little. Huh? So Khaybar, Abu Huraira comes after Khaybar, and they are. The tribe of a dose comes with him. I don't know if they came at the same time. Okay. So he is a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He passes away in the year 18 after the Hijrah. In whenever you hear someone passed away in the year 18 after the Hijrah, only one place should come to your mind. Only one place. Where? Not Tabuk. Yermuk? No. It's not a battle. There you go. There you go. They pass away in the plague. Where was the plague in? In the Sham. Right? Um, he was one of those people that passed away. Um, uh, in, 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 that, uh, in the plague that struck, um, and there was a lot of companions of the Prophet ﷺ that passed away. He has a number of ahadith, both in Bukhari and in Muslim. Um, the fact that he is from the Asha'ira, from uh, Al-Ash'ariyun, 
it is a virtue for him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said about them that ana minhum, hum minni wa ana minhum that I am from them and they are from me. When he saw the way that they cared for one another, right? And the most famous companion from that tribe is who? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu, right? Um, the one that Allah subhanahu wa taala blessed with a an amazing voice, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um, used to listen to his Quran. And also, um, Umar bin Khattab used to make him lead whenever he would begin a gathering with the recitation of the Quran. Not a lot is known about Abu Malik during the time of even his name, Harith, is disputed. Uh, Imam al nawawi mentions that there's 10 possible names for him. Um, but during the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, he was uh, made you know, one of the leaders of Asha, And this is how he passes away in the, uh, in the play. So he says, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, At-tuhuru shatru al-eeman. Um, this hadith again comes to us in many different books of sunnah. Um, both, all of them coming from uh, Abu Malik and also others. And here when it says, At-tuhuru shatru al-eeman. Um, what does our trans... Purity is half of iman. Okay. It says purity is half of iman. Um, in another place, and what comes in the Jam Imam al-Tirmidhi, it says, Al-wudu u shatru al-eeman. That wudu is half of iman. Oh, al-isbaagh al-wudu, uh, isbaagh al-wudu, al-iman, um, that the perfection of wudu is from half of faith, um, and so on. This is a hadith that when you look at this beginning of the word, generally the way that we use it, we say that uh, purity is half of faith. What it actually means is purity is half of salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, he refers to salah as iman. When he tells us about uh, when the qibla was changed, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ Imanakum, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to waste your iman. And what this meant was the salahs that you've been praying towards the uh, Baytul Maqdis, they're not going to be wasted. When the qibla was changed, the reward is still going to be there. And out of all of the opinions that are given, and there's many for it and how it could be, the best one is that this is talking about salah, right? Imam Muslim, uh, the one that narrated this hadith, uh, Ibn Majah uh, and Nasa'i, they all put this in the chapters concerning salah and also concerning wudu. Right, so when they put it, the only time that wudu is being mentioned is where it is at tahul right? Purity, purification, it is half of your iman. And in that hadith that we quoted earlier where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, the key to Jannah is Salah. And then he says, and the key to Salah is what? Tahara. Tahara is the key. Without Tahara, Salah is not accepted. And um, also the way that they, you know, they, uh, Ibn Rajib, he says when he looks at this hadith, he says there are some that say, that iman, what it does is that it purifies, uh, it purifies inside. So it is an internal type of purification. And then when you look at the external type, tahara, it's with water. It's how we purify ourselves. So it says this is half of our iman and we understand it to be half of our salah. Without salah, uh, we cannot have, without salah, without tahara, we cannot have prayer. The other way that they've also interpreted it means tahara here tahur means the purification that a person has on the inside from shirk, from shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya ayuha al-muddathir, qum fa'anthir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, and then, wa thiyabaka fa'tahhir. Right, like purify your clothing, right? Purify your clothing. And then an, another type of purification that you have to do is what? Right after, wa thiyabaka fa'tahhir, what comes? Wa rujza fahjur. What is al-rujz? Idols, idols, stay away from the idols, purify yourself from the idols. And this is, you know, with, with Tawheed, a person purifies uh, himself uh, internally. With Wudu, he purifies, or with, with uh, Tahara on the outside, he purifies outside. Then he says, Walhamdulillah, tamla'u al-mizan. That Alhamdulillah, the statement, it fills the scale. Ya yeah, Allah. How easy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it for us to be rewarded for deeds. A person repeating the word, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, engaging in it, he is going to fill the scale on the Day of Judgment. You know, when we come on the Day of Judgment, all of our deeds are going, there's going to be a scale. And this scale on one side would be placed all of our good deeds, on the other, all of our bad deeds. Right? And whichever one is heavier determines where a person ends up. May Allah make our scale of good deeds heavy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, مَوَازِينُ That whoever's scale is heavy on that day, what happens to him? He's going to have a life he's pleased with. The life after that comes after that scale is heavy, 
Ya Allah, it's going to be a very pleasing one to him. And then وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُ That whoever scale is light on that day, what happens to him? There's nothing but the fire that is waiting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And one of the ways that we fill it is with the statement, Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins his book with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whenever he would speak, Whenever he would speak, he would always begin with what they call the hamdala, the, the phrase of alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, or alhamdulillah, other things. Other ayats in the Quran are also begun um, with alhamdulillah. It is from the most virtuous of statements that a person could make, right? Saying alhamdulillah, and it needs to be something that constantly we are saying. Now, what does alhamdulillah mean, right? Generally here it says, praise be to Allah. Alhamdulillah, what it actually means. It is because of how perfect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, he needs to be praised. Not because of the things that he has given me, not because of the favors that he has done for me, no. Because of how perfect Allah is, he deserves to be praised. And for that we say, Alhamdulillah. Right? We have Rabbul Alameen, he deserves to be praised for all that he has done, not to me, but because of who he is. Then he says after that, wa subhanallahi wa alhamdulillahi tamla'ani aw tamla'u ma bayna samai wal ard. And he says, wa subhanallahi wa alhamdulillah, the statement together, saying subhanallah and alhamdulillah, tamla'ani, that they fill, o tamla'u ma bayna samai wal ard, or they fill what is between the heavens and the earth. Whenever you come to this, uh, any hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the word o is used, o is used, it is not the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? In this case where he's telling you either it's tamla'ani or tamla'u from the person that is narrating the hadith, he's not sure if the statement was tamla'ani or tamla'u ma bayna samai wal ard. Um, in what comes to us in different books of Sunan, not in the Sahih Imam Muslim, the way that this hadith comes, it even says, wa subhanallahi tamla'u by itself. And walhamdulillahi tamla'u by itself. So you have these different gradings for it on, or these different rewards that are attached to it. The other thing also that comes is, is it that these two statements together, is it that these two statements together, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, that fill what is between the heavens and the earth, right? Or between this land of ours, all the way to the highest of skies, or is it by themselves, this is what they do, right? And um, if we take tamla'ani, we would say that it, it's, it's by themselves that they do. Each individual word fills from the heavens to the sky. Or, tamla'u, that both of them together, the statement, subhanallah and alhamdulillah, this is what they do. Right? They feel this, like in terms of how good deeds that you are going to have, it is going to be this big. From down here to the highest levels. And uh, we just said what alhamdulillah is, subhanallah. What does subhanallah mean? Huh? How perfect is Allah? Uh, how far from imperfection is Allah? You know, that's a very, very close English translation. When someone does tasbih, when you say subhanallah, what you are saying is this. You are saying from every single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been accused of, from every lie that has come to, from every distortion that has come against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanallah. Allah is far away from Right, and you see this in the Quran uh, where the tasbih is used many times with the phrase subhanallah, many times it's used. And generally it comes after an accusation has been made, an accusation has been made against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, usually you would see it come, what's the greatest, what's the worst type of dhulm that was brought? Sure. Or the worst, shirk, right? Uh, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the idea that they said Allah has a son, the next thing that comes is tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You see it in Surah Al-Baqarah. You see it throughout the Quran, this is what you see. وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ What's after you keep going? This is Surah Maryam. What's the one in Surah Al-Baqarah? First juz. Ah, salamat. Ibrahim comes right after it. No, I, I see the verse, I just it's not coming to me. I see it. It's on the left side. 
three verses later the page ends and the top of the page it's uh, right it's like four verses down yeah Allah may Allah grant us uh, may Allah make us from the people of Quran so uh, subhanallah that's what it means Allah is perfect Allah is removed from all of the perfections from all of the imperfections that have been said about him Allah is far and when you say Subha subhanallah this is what you are doing right and this is a statement that we should be saying whenever we are amazed or whenever we hear things from the people they talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we say subhanallah subhanallah that Allah is, is this is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and um, we know that different forms of it is virtuous not just subhanallah but also subhanallah al azim subhanallah wa bihamdi subhana rabbi al a'la and different things the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the hadith of abu huraira he says, "Kalimatani khafifatani ala lisani, thaqilatani fil mizani, mahbubatani, or habibatani ila rahmani." Subhanallah al Azim, Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Two statements, very easy on the tongue, very easy on the tongue for a person to say, very heavy on the scale, and it is beloved to Ar Rahman. It is that state, statement that begin with both of them begin with Subhanallah. So it is something that we should be constantly doing, um, uh, you know, saying the tasbih. And also saying the, tah the tahmeed of Alhamdulillah. Then he says, وَالصَّلَاةُ نُورُ And that salah is nur. Generally, uh, before we get to the salah, when it comes to the best statements that a person could say, there are four of them. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, and Allahu Akbar. These are the greatest statements that a person could say. We know that in uh, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tell me words that I can praise you by. And he's told what? Say La ilaha illallah. And then he says, no, everyone says this, I want something personal, like by myself. Right, something that only I have access to and is great. And then the Prophet, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, he says that if you were to take, if you were to take La ilaha illallah and put it on one side of the scale, and you took everything else that has been created and put it on the other side of the scale. What would be heavier? La ilaha illallah. And in the story of the man that comes on the day of judgment, he has 99 scrolls as far as the eye can see filled with sins. He goes through them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him, those that wrote this down, have they oppressed you? He says, no, they have not oppressed me. He says, do you have any excuse today? Do you have anything that could you know, go against this? He says, I have nothing. So I have nothing. He says, today is the day that we don't oppress a person. Everything that you have done is going to be given to you. He says, here's a piece of paper. And a piece of paper is given to him. What does he say on it? La ilaha illallah. This is all it has. And he says, what is this waraqa going to do? Amam hadihi sajillah. Like when you look at these scrolls, over, what, what is la ilaha illallah? One piece of paper. Versus 99 scrolls, when you open it, it goes as far as the eye can see. What is this going to do? He says, put it on the scale. And that one, la ilaha illallah piece of paper, far greater than the 99, you know, scrolls as far as the eye can see filled with the sins. So these are from the, the best of statements that a person could say, these four right here. And we should be a people where these are constantly on our tongues. La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gave virtue to it, right? In the beginning, if you say it, and just whenever you wake up in the morning, you begin with it. When you sleep with it, you go with it. If it becomes the last thing that you say in this dunya, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah, that whoever's last statement is la ilaha illallah, what happens to him? The khalal jannah, he's going to enter jannah. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, at any time, man qala la ilaha illallah, muqinan fi qalbihi, the khalal jannah. Whoever says it with yaqeen, with certainty, la ilaha illallah, jannah is guaranteed for him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, man qala la ilaha illallah, Sit like with, with truthfulness, you'll enter Jannah. So many different things. Ha. See, the Quran, when he was passing, he, he said that. Allahu Akbar. Akbar. What, no, what, what did he actually say? He said, I don't know how to do it. So much kibir. Even he refused to say, La ilaha illallah. He says, Amantuhu. I believe in what? Not Rabbi Musa. That's what the, the people said. That's what the magician said. He says, I believe in the Lord that the people have believed in. But by that time, 
that time خلاص, it was it was too late so how do we apply that hadith to it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that babu tawbah the door of tawbah is open before two things happen only two things close the door of tawbah one it's a general one which is the rising of the sun from the from, from the west once that happens خلاص, door of tawbah is done there's no more talk. What's, and then the other one is malam <laughs> By the time the soul comes here, it's too late. Door of Toba is closed. The, the soul of, of uh, Fir'aun at that time, did it get to this place? Yeah. He's drowning. But the khalas is finished for him. So his Toba now at that time of desperation is not going to count. It's not going to count. Right? So uh, these are words that we need to constantly be saying. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells the companions about the adhkar that they should be doing, these are the ones. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, you know, وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَاتُ خَيْرٌ And the Rabbi, like the, the righteous baqiyat, the salihat, that are actually going to remain, they're better. And what those are, subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah, and so on, uh, these type of adhkars. And we should be as the people sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about them, that you should keep your tongue moist, with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says after that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَالصَّلَاةُ نُورٌ That salah is nur. Salah is nur in this life and also in the hereafter. Salah will be our nur in this life and in the hereafter. In this life, it is through salah that you are able to erase the sins that came before. And it also prevents you from committing sins that are ahead. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, that a salah, what does it do? Tanha. That it prevents you from committing these sins. That means in the future, it prevents you from doing it. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a requirement for the believers to be able to enter Jannah, that they're going to be tested with their light. Their nur is going to be their test at two places, on their way to the Sirat and on, on the Sirat. On the way to Sirat, on the way to Sirat, by this time in the standing, all of the believers are left, all of the munafiqeen are left. The mushrikeen, the kuffar and so on, they've already gone to Jahannam. At this point, light disappears. Light disappears. And then the people of Salah, this is where their nur is going to come. The people of Iman, and then they'll begin walking with their light. The munafiqeen, are they going to have this light? No. They're not going to have this light. But are they going to see the light? They'll see the light in front of them. What do they say? Wait for us. Wait for us. Let us take some of your light so we can go on this journey. And the believers, may Allah make us from amongst them. What do they say to them? <laughs> I said, I, I can't give you this light. But go back. Go and get it from where we got it from. And what do they mean where we got it from? Go back to the dunya. That's where you get it. Through these right, righteous actions. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do? فَضُرِبَ بَيْنَهُمْ بِسُورِ اللَّهُ That a door is going to, a barrier is made between them. بَعْطِينُهُ فِيهِ الرَّحْمَةِ Whoever's in, on the inside, and this is for the believers, mercy is going, they, they, they've earned the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then on the outside, قِبَلِهِ الْعَذَابِ Punishment, now it's their time to be punished. So nur in this life, and in the hereafter, and from the, from the easiest way to go to Jannah, and from the most easiest ways to go to the fire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whoever perfects his wudu, perfects his rak'ah, the standing, whoever perfects his uh, ruku', whoever perfects his sujood, Salah is going to protect him. Salah will protect him. It will be his protection for this person. And whoever does not, it is going to come and say, just like you played with me, may Allah play with you. Like, may you be destroyed now. You, didn't do, you did not, the sanctity that was there, the way that salah you should have been praying, you did not do it. So now, just like just like you wasted me. You didn't give me my rights. May your rights not be taken away. We don't want salah to come to us on the day of judgment like this. The Prophet wasallam said, when a person is inside of the grave, salah will come to him, salah will come to him, either as somebody that is young and can protect him, or somebody that is old and cannot help him in any way. And what happens? The one that is young, the one that prayed his salah properly. And the one that didn't, 
So I have someone that won't be able to protect you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. In the grave nur, in the hereafter nur, in this life nur. And on top of that, it is from the signs of iman that a person is very, very strict with his salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about the, about the prophets of Allah. And then he says, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ That afterwards, a people came. A people that were left behind after the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What did they do? وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ They first, أَضَعُوا الصَّلَاةِ They played with the salah. Then they followed their desires. فَسَوْفَ قَوْنَ غَيَّ We're going to throw them in الْغَيْ Into a valley in the fire. Where the, va- the fire itself, Jahannam itself, seeks protection from it. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks, he, he, he tells us to ask the people, ما سلككم في سقر What led you to, to, be, to end up in a saqar? In this valley in the fire. What's the response? قالوا لم نكن من المصلين We were not from the people that pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one of the earliest surahs that we memorize, رأيت الذي يكذب بالدين Do you see the one that, you know, like he doesn't see the value of this religion. At the end, or in the middle of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? Al-wayl for those that pray. For those that pray. And a, a wail is what? A valley in the fire. For those that pray, why? They prayed salah. And just like the ones before, salah, they prayed the salah. But what they did was they played around with it. They waited until the last time for them to pray. They waited until there was not enough time for them to, they would begin praying. The proper time to pray would come and they wouldn't pray it. The way that it should be prayed, the way that the ruku' should be handled, the way that the athkar should be made, they did not handle it. Now guess what ends up happening? Khalas, Jahannam is the only thing that is waiting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Right? All of it, not even just regular Jahannam is being taught for the people of Salah. You are going to get a valley in the fire. Valleys of the fire. And this is going to be, you know, in Jahannam, the worst places of punishment is in the valleys. The worst places. The most intense heat. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling you about Jahannam seeking protection from it. Right? When in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, اشتكت النار إلى ربها, That the fire complained to Allah one day. And he said, أكل بعضي بعضا, That some parts of mine are eating other parts. The parts that are eating the, the valley. The valleys are eating the other parts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you're going to have you know, two moments of ease. One for shita'i and one with the safe. One in the summer and one in the winter. You'll have a point of, to just breathe and that eating is not going to happen. Your parts, one of the others is not going to eat the other part. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the, what you find from the most extreme heat in the summer, that is the day that Jahannam is taking its breath. And what you find from the coldest in the winter, that is Jahannam taking its breath. And we know what these days are. No matter where you are in the world, you know how hot and how freezing that day is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So salah, you know, we have to make sure that we are a people that you know, give it the right that it is due. Salah, Allah made it, we do it five times a day. And it really shows you the importance of it, that constantly you have to engage in it. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the only obligation that had to be given from the heavens, that had to be given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not like that of salah, not, not like that of, of others, where they came from Jibril alayhi salam by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This one, he had to go from this dunya away from it. Then he was given to it. Then he says, was sadaqah to burhan, that sadaqah, it is burhan, it is a proof for a person. And burhan, what it means here, the iman of a person, the proof for it if you want to see the sadaqah that they give. The sadaqah that they give. And this sadaqah here means both of the types of sadaqah that we have. One type of sadaqah, one that is an obligation. Another type of sadaqah, one that is optional. In the Quran and in the Sunnah, whenever you hear sadaqah by itself, you assume that it is both of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, he says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Take from their wealth. What? صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ Like take from them sadaqah. And this doesn't, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does not take things that are not an obligation to take. So he's being told sadaqah here means zakah. Take from them zakah. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he says, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ That a sadaqah is for who? 
للفقراء والمساكين and then the, uh, to the end of the ayah where we're told about the categories of people that take not sadaqa but the people that take zakat right and then also in the Quran you see them um, you know you see sadaqa being used for what we understand to be sadaqa right which is like us giving charity giving donation not an obligation one right and you see this through the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but when a person is able to give this this is a sign of their iman because when it comes to wealth and the way that Allah created us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا Ya Allah, the, the, like heavy clinging, heavy love that has been created between the man and the wealth that he has. زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَائِ And then, الْبَنِينَ وَالْقَنَاطِيرِ And so on, that Allah has beautified the love of wealth in our hearts. So for a person being able to come and take out what he loves dearly and give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it is by force, meaning it is zakah, or whether it is by choice, this is a sign of this person's iman. Right? And sadaqah also, um, uh, you know, for those that are unable to give with money, there are many other different categories for it. The, the, the companions, a group of them came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, you know, ahlul duthur, those that are wealthy, they give with their money and they pray salah with us. They fast with us. It's not fair. How can we keep up with them? Right? And then the Prophet sallallahu told them, you know that every tasbih, every tahmeed, every tahmeed, that's sadaqah. Right? So increase in it if you're unable to give from the wealth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those unable to give. Uh, the one with charity is approved. Yes. Does that mean it's proof that... Of, of the person's iman. Yes. Sadaqa, it is a burhan to the iman of a person. Only people of iman give sadaqa the way that it should be given. May Allah make us from amongst those people. On top of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says about shaitan, Inna shaytana ya'idukum what? He promises you what? Faqr. He promises you poverty. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us this? Because when it is time for your burhan to be apparent, for your iman to be shown, uh-oh, your kids are in need of it. Your family is in need of it. Keep that. Don't give it. Don't give it. Right? Don't give it. You need it. Poverty is right here placed in front of you. So how do you m move past this place? Your iman has to shine through. You say, you know what? This is what he, as he says on the day of judgment, all of the promises that he makes, right? all of the promises he makes, one day shaitan has to stand and testify, all of it was false. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he tells us in what surah? Surah Al-Hijr. Surah Al-Hijr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ مَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ That Allah gave you a, a, a truthful promise. I gave you a promise and I went against it. I had no ability to actually fulfill it. Then what does he say? فَلَا تَلُومُونِ Don't blame me. Don't blame me. وَلُومُ فُسَكُمْ ah. That's Surah Ibrahim. لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُتِ اللَّهِ بِاللَّهِ One Surah over. One Surah this way. Okay, that's, that is Surah Ibrahim. Right? That's Surah Ibrahim. Um, this, is, this is, he goes against the oath that he made. He will never be able to fulfill it. He will never be able to fulfill it. So it is a burhan. With that promise, false promises he's given you, you of giving sadaqah, it becomes a sign of the iman that you have. Then he says, وَالصَّبْرُ ضِيَاءُ That's sabr. Patience. Patience is ضِيَاءُ. What is ضِيَاءُ? What does it say in English? Okay, let's do this. The sun gives off nur. The moon gives off ضِيَاءُ. It illuminates. Doesn't give light off, but it illuminates. And this is what, what sabr is. What is sabr here? Huh? Who wants to take a guess? Actual, does it say patience? It does say patience for us. Constancy and perseverance. Anybody else? What is sabr here? Huh? Siyam. Siyam, fasting. This is talking about fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, Istainu bi sabri wa sara. Hold on to your, like, hold, like, seek the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through patience and through prayer. Patience, it could mean sabr, like whatever is coming to have patience. But it also means fasting. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, 
من من صام ثلاثة أيام من كل شهر شهر that whoever fasts three days out of every month وصام شهر الصبر and he fasts the month of patience it is as if he fasted the entire year so he refers to sabr here as what what is the month of sabr Ramadan right so here what is going to illuminate fasting this is what it does it illuminates it makes things that are dark burhan it means if things that are dark light is going to be there in another hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says about fasting that it is what a jannah that it is a shield that it is going to protect you right and we need to become a people that not only fast the month of Ramadan, but a people that fast other days. The least of it is that we fast three days out of the month, out of every month. And this is the lowest level of fasting, the, the sunnah. That you fast every month, you fast three days. Huh. The two days of the week are much better. Because the two days of the week end up eight days of the month. So it goes, this is the level of fasting. You have three days out of every month, lowest level. Then after that, you have a fasting of Monday and Thursdays, which goes to eight days. Then after that, you have a fasting of one day taking a break for two days. All right, take one day, you take a break for two days. How many days? Things like 16 days, something like one, two. How many days? 10 days, 10 days. Then after that, you have the fasting of Half, so 15 days. One day on, one day off. And this, these are the levels of fasting. We want to get somewhere there. Really, whenever, whenever you look, when you, when you think about sunnah fasting, sunnah fasting, when you think about it, I want you to always think about Hafsa radiallahu anha. Hafsa radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the daughter of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divorces her. Right? He sends her home. Jibril alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says, As-salamu yuqri'uka salam that salam is giving you salams, that Allah is, is, is giving you, you know, greetings of peace. Wa yaqulu lak, and he's telling you. And when Allah is telling somebody something, what does it mean? It's commanding. Rajih hafsa, fa innaha sawwamatun qawwama. Allah is telling you you have to take back hafsa. Cancel your divorce, you cannot divorce her. Why? Because she is sawamatun qawwama, that she stands during the, day, the, the night to pray, and she spends the days fasting. If that is her, you, the divorce of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being taken away. So how much virtue is in fasting? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, not a person fasts a day outside of Ramadan, except Allah makes the distance between him and the fire, he creates a distance between them of 70 years. SubhanAllah. Imagine that, how far you go from, from, from the fire. And then again, another day of fasting, another day of fasting, another day of fasting. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, لِصَائِمِ farhatan That for the fasting person, he has two moments of happiness. Two moments of happiness. What is the first one? فَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ فِطْرِ When he breaks his fast. Right? And what this means is when you are breaking it, you realize, today I spent the entire day in the worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In a deed in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about it in a hadith Qudsi, He says, Kullu amal ibn Adam alah. Every action of the children of Adam is for them. Except illa sawm, except fasting. فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَانَ أَجْزِيبِ Because it's for me and I'm going to reward it. Okay. It doesn't Allah reward all deeds? All the deeds that I do is, am, am I not waiting for rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But this is to show you that Allah is not going to treat it like the other ibadat. It is going to be. Like something special, right? So the first happiness, when you're breaking your fast. The second one, وَفَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ لِقَاءِ رَبِّي That the happiness that comes when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, may Allah make us happy when we break our fast and we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says, وَالْقُرْآنُ حُجَّةٌ لَكَ أَوْ عَلَيْكَ May Allah protect us. He says the Qur'an, the Qur'an, it is going to come and it will either be for you or it will be against you. No, there's no third option. The Qur'an is either for you or against you. First thing that we have to understand about the Qur'an, Allah has not made it an obligation upon the people to memorize the Qur'an. Right? He has not made it an obligation on everybody to memorize the Qur'an. But He has made it an obligation upon the people for them to all read the Qur'an. You will come on the Day of Judgment. You will come on the Day of Judgment. And 
either the Quran is going to come and testify for you. The Prophet sallallahu said, on the day of, the, of judgment, the Quran is going to be, it's going to come and it is going to be led by Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran. And they're going to come and either say, this is a person of the Quran. So we want, let us testify for him. Or he was not a person of the Quran, let us testify against him. The Prophet sallallahu he complains in Surah Al-Furqan. What does he say? In the qawmi ittakhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. That the messenger is complaining that the people have taken the Qur'an as something that should be avoided, something that they should stay away from. That's something they should move away from it. And it is not a person just leaves the recitation of it. He leaves the implementation. He leaves the thinking about the ayats. He leaves the purpose of the Qur'an, which is supposed to get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is from, you know, when, when we talk about other messengers, we love to talk about the miracles that they had. We talk about Musa. Can you imagine Allah gave him the ability to throw down a staff and it turned into, into a snake? Right? He parted the Red Sea. And we're amazed at all of these, all of these miracles that were given to these uh, different prophets. But when we come to the greatest miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, well, it's just like, oh, it's okay. It's fine. <coughs> we don't give it the due that it has. And we don't want it to testify against us on the Day of Judgment. You and I, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he's advising the companions on how long a person should take to recite the Qur'an. How long should, should it go? And he says that the least of it, the least of it is that every month, it takes a person one month to complete the entire Qur'an from beginning to end. And we look, how many of us are going to come on the Day of Judgment? Not a single time has it been completed. Maybe for some of us, the last time that we looked through the pages of the Qur'an, Ramadan. Everyone is talking about the Qur'an, let me open it up. And from then, the Qur'an becomes closed and doesn't see our eyes until next Ramadan comes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. All right? It will only come as one of these two things. The Quran will be your companion inside of the grave. The most honored of people in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are who? The people of Quran. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says about them, Ahlullahi wa khasatu. These, these are the people of Allah. The people of Quran, they are the people of Allah. And the, they're the special group of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, a person that recites the Qur'an, a person that recites the Qur'an, and the one that does not recite it, what is the difference between these two people? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, the one that recites it, right? And when we say recite, not just opening it and reading it, but also the implementation of it, the tadabbur of the ayats that are inside, right? He is like, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refers to him as, as, as you know, uh, the one that is, recites it and he's f proficient in it and he recites it profit, proper, properly, he's going to be with who? Kiram al Barara, right? With those that, the honored malaika and the one that struggles to recite, but he still goes. Prophet وسلم, he said, Yatata'ata, like every time his struggle comes, comes very hard for him to read, but he continues. The Prophet says, for him, he'll have double the reward. He'll have the reward of, of his struggling, struggling to recite, and also the fact that he is reciting. The Prophet وسلم, said, La hasada illa fithnatayn. There is no envy except in two people. You cannot envy people except if, for two reasons. One of them, it is someone that Allah blessed with wealth, and he goes and he spends it. And he goes and he spends it. And then the other, is a person that recites the Quran ana al Day and night he's reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of the Quran. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Kullu nasi yaghdu. Every single person, when he leaves his house in the morning, when he leaves his house in the morning, when he wakes up in the morning, his soul is on the table. And he's heading to the markets wherever he goes. And the condition of the people, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, فَبَائِعُوا نَفْسَهُ Like he, you, you, every day you're selling yourself. You are selling your nafs. What happens? He says, فَمُعْتِقُهَا أَوْ مُوْبِقُهَا And the way that you sell it, either you're, you're buying this nafs of yours back, you're just buying it back by doing righteous deeds, or you are just, you're destroying it. 
and you're letting it be bought with whoever wants to buy it. And this is the condition people find themselves in every single day. Every day that Allah has given it to you, either you are freeing yourself from the fire or you are throwing yourself into the fire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And really this coming at the end of the hadith, it is telling you that how do you become from amongst the first people? How do you become from those that save their nafs? Look at what we have just told you to do. Look at what ha we've just explained. We told you to fast. And that fasting is going to illuminate for you to have patience. We told you to give sadaqah. You're being told to pray. You're being told those are too heavy to do extra more than what has become, what, what, what was an obligation. Khalas. Busy yourself with saying subhanallah. Busy yourself with saying alhamdulillah. Busy yourself with these type of adhkars that are going to please you on the day of judgment. And this is the way that a person saves himself. That he's busy with these things. And if you're not busy with it, khalas. You're destroying yourself. That's what you're doing to your nafs. And the day that you realize the destruction of it, it will not be in this dunya. May Allah protect us. It will be when you're standing and you realize your soul is being judged now. What did it do? How did it spend its days? Right? This salah, is it going to come on the day of judgment? And it's going to come as a, a, a proof for me? My fasting, my sadaqah, my tasbih, my tongue, is it going to say that I was from amongst those that did the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was busy with the dhikr of Allah. Or is it going to say that everything that was displeasing to it was the fastest thing to come to it? The Quran when it comes. The Quran, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, you know, fasting and Quran, they, they're going to come on the day of judgment and try to intercede for their companion. And Siyam is going to say, because of me, he was tired during the day. And the Quran is going to say, because of me, he was tired during the night. Are we going to be from amongst these people? Or is it just like you destroyed us? May you be destroyed. All of these actions coming on that day, testifying against us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of fasting, people of salah, people of righteous deeds. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free our nafs. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen.